Um, so I wanted to uh, do this talk primarily because I was on the uh, Google groups for BDD. I hang out there quite a lot. And somebody wrote saying, I've got all these problems. I'm, I can't find a way in my enterprise environment to do BDD with things like integration testing and performance testing and non-functional testing. And he listed a whole bunch of things that he was trying to do with BDD. Um, and I replied and I said, there's going to be a theme here. I was a bit snarky. I said, there's going to be a theme here. See if you can spot it. And to each little paragraph, I responded with, BDD is not about testing. Okay, this is my big club that I use to hit everybody with. It's not about testing. Uh, and somebody replied back to me and said, you know, you can't just tell people they're doing it wrong. Uh, people don't respond well to that. I said, ah, my bad. It's not that it's wrong. Everything that he's talking about is really great. It's testing. And BDD isn't about testing. It's not, you're, you're trying to fit something that's about testing into BDD's framework. There's some overlap, a tiny overlap between BDD and testing. BDD is not a testing practice. And a lot of people seem to be very confused about that at the moment. Um, somebody on Stack Overflow wrote and said, uh, I've got this equation that I'm trying to specify in BDD and I don't know how to do it. Should I have one scenario with all the possibilities in that really shows the equation? Or several small scenarios, but then the overall structure of the equation will get lost. And I said, well, most people put the blurb at the top, but..." I felt really bad while I was saying it and, and showing him where he could put this little equation because he said, we have to write all our requirements as Gherkin scenarios in Cucumber. Um, there are a ton of tools out there. There's a ton of techniques out there that you can use as well as BDD. And if you're doing testing, testing is great. I love testers, but BDD isn't about testing. Dan, particularly when he introduced BDD, was getting rid of the word test from TDD, which wasn't about testing either. And he says, behavior is a more useful word than test. So OK, if BDD isn't about testing, what is BDD about? Well, there's a really lovely phrase I picked up from Dan earlier today. He says, it diminishes the handoff between silos. Right? It helps people collaborate around the requirements. And I want to talk a little bit today about why that's important. And that will show you what BDD is really about. So to look at why it's really important, um, I'm going to introduce this framework to you in the most brief introduction I've ever done. This is Kenevin. Who's heard of Kenevin? Fantastic. Who hasn't heard of Kenevin? I should have written the, the name of it here so you can actually see it. C-Y-N-E-F-I-N. It's a Welsh word. Say the word Kevin to me. Like Kevin Costner, say Kevin. Put an N in it. Say Kenevin. Well, now you can pronounce it. Great. Um, so. It's got these five domains, including one in the middle, and it describes different problems that you encounter. On the left-hand side, these obvious and complicated problems, they're predictable. They have a known outcome to them. They're mechanical things, um, scientific things, things where you do the same thing again and again, you get the same result. Down here, we have the chaotic domain. Chaos is not normally a good place to be. It's accident and emergency. It's urgent production bugs. Our problem comes with this complex domain. The complex domain is a domain where things emerge, things that we've never done before, things where we make discoveries about them. And I often use this little scale just to help people work out where they are in this domain. I ask who in the world's ever done this before. Um, and sometimes nobody's ever done it before. We don't know if it's going to work at all. Sometimes somebody's done it, but they've done it outside of the organization. So one of our competitors, or we know it can be done, but we don't know what they discovered along the way. And now we're about to discover it too. Every single project or change effort is driven by one of these. You're always trying to provide new capabilities, letting your, your staff, your users do something they've never been able to do before, your back-end systems, or do it in a new context. Even if it's a non-functional thing like maintenance, you're going to be able to maintain it where you couldn't before. There's always something new that's driving what you're doing. Always a 504. As well as that, we might have some boring stuff that somebody, out, somebody within the organization has done before, or we can learn the relevant expertise by YouTube, book, something like that. Or somebody in the team's done it before, or we all know how to do it. And now we're getting down to the really boring stuff. Those fives and fours cause us a problem when we come across BDD. They are complex. They sit very firmly in this domain up here. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. 
Okay, so what does it look like if we don't um, collaborate and we don't work around those fives and fours together as a team? Well, you're probably used to it. Who's been on a water pool project before? Yeah, lots of us, okay? So you know how this works. Um, you do the analysis up front, right? And you do it in isolation without the devs being around. Now, typically, this is actually what happens on most Agile projects as well, because you need to do the analysis in order to get your budget. Hands up who's on one of those Agile projects or been on one recently, right? So we're used to this anyway. This is one of the things that happens. We get the analysis done up front. And then the devs come along, and they do the development, and eventually you hand it to the testers, and the testers get to test it. The rule for analysis, because it's being done in isolation and you won't get a chance to get feedback on your work, is you've got to get it right. That's the rule, and this has become the culture. We still, still spend a lot of time assuming analysts have got it right instead of giving them feedback on their work. And then the devs take it, and the devs say, you know, well, we did what you asked for, and we got it right, and if you're using Cucumber, we can prove that we got it right. And then the testers get hold of it and say, yeah, right. <laughs> okay. Um, this, is, this is where you actually do much of your learning. It's that last little phase where you're doing the testing. And if your testers aren't testing it, you put it into production, and then your users are testing it for you instead. Okay. The thing is that you only really learn when you're in that complex domain by doing something. You only make the discoveries by trying it out. Analysis does not work in complexity. You end up with long analysis paralysis and thrashing sessions, or even worse, you leave all the really risky, high discovery stuff till late in the day, and then you make all the discoveries, and then everybody's working weekends and overtime trying to catch up. That's not useful. So we have a new rule. And this is the thing that BDD helps you do. It's also what's behind pretty much every single Agile practice out there. You're trying to minimize your speculative investment. That means we don't know whether what we're doing is a good idea or not. We don't know whether we're going in the right direction. So we want to put as little effort, as little investment into it as we can before we get that learning. So if we're going to do BDD, we're going to have a conversation. We're going to write things down, possibly in Gherkin, and we're going to automate them. Is that the smallest investment we can actually make in finding out whether we got things wrong? Well, automation takes some time, especially when it's the first time you do it. It's actually a reasonably heavy investment process. So we don't really need to do that. Even writing things down takes time. If you document them in the moment, you know, that can make a, a meeting, your three amigos meeting, go quite a, a long meeting. So that's a little bit of an investment as well. That's the smallest investment we can make. That is the smallest thing we can be doing to find out whether we're doing things right or wrong. So I want to show you something. Um, this is a fairly new thing. It's only come out this year. Um, it's called liminal Kinevin. So for those of you who've already come across Kinevin, this little green line is a new thing. And it defines these two zones between complex and chaotic and between the complex and the complicated world. Um, I'm not going to talk about chaos today. So I'm not introducing the Kinevin framework because I've only got 15 minutes. And if I talk about everything I, I love about Kinevin, it will take me five hours. Um, but I will talk about this boundary because it's really, really interesting. Here's what happens. When we start off, we start learning, we start exploring, we start making discoveries about what the problem really is. I'm working with things that I've never even touched before. I'm making an awful lot of discoveries. Um, I sent out a tweet that said, you know, it turns out when you don't know what you don't know, you don't know which of what you don't know you don't know you don't know the least about. Um, <laughs> Somebody actually reached out to me over DM and said, are you all right, Liz? Uh, <laughs> it's like, yeah, I'm just modding things in Skyrim, it's fine. Um, I'm having a lot of fun with it, but it's a very high discovery space. And I've got some tests. I've kind of captured my thoughts. I've used Cucumber to do it. I'm working alone. But there's gaps. There's things that I haven't filled in. 
there's bits where I've moved from one class to another and I haven't put TDD around them yet. I just wrote it because it looked like a good idea. And you'll find this massive lack of formality when you start experimenting. You start doing what we call probe. You'll be spiking. You'll be prototyping. Things will be in flux. If you're doing it really well, you'll be doing multiple parallel experiments to try and find out what the right answer is. We actually did this on one project. Um, we had a trading system with a brand new UI that we were providing for these traders. And the analysis had already been done. We'd had the UX people, we'd had the UI designers, and they had designed this beautiful UI. And because it was new, because I recognized that it was risky, I kind of knocked it up in a hurry, hard-coded. And we got it in front of the traders, and they looked at it and they said, oh, I need to use the mouse. Like, it's a table, I've got to, I've got to scroll with this table, which means I need to use the mouse. I can't have anything which means I need to use the mouse. And we're like, what? And they said, well, I spend most of my time on the train or in a car. I don't have a table, I can't use a mouse. Don't make me use a trackpad for this. We're like, oh, okay, that didn't come up. Now, we had to do what you never do, which is we, we lost our UI designers, they'd gone off to the next thing. So we only had devs available, so we devs designed the UI. I don't make a practice of this unless you're going to do it in parallel. So independently trying things out. This is how we discovered what the requirements should be. We each tried a different kind of UI, just a bit of light conversation with the BA, and experimented with something. And we actually kept two of the three ideas we came up with. So we had two different ways of inputting a trade into this system. There was no BDD involved. There was no cucumber involved. We used examples in the conversations, but that was it. We didn't put even TDD around things. There was no behavior. It was all hard-coded. But it was enough to get it in front of the traders. It was enough to get their feedback. So when you start doing something like this, give it a try. Don't worry about actually putting down, you know, putting your automation in place. You might want to sketch out a couple of the ideas that look like good ideas, just write them down. They don't have to be in Gherkin. Nobody actually uses Gherkin in real conversation. People talk, um, they use the word if instead of given. They'll put the context after the event. They'll say things like, you know, if I look for a car and it's a, I'm searching for a red Ford Sierra, then um, if it can't find a Ford Sierra, it should find me one of these other things. You know, it should find me a, a, a Ford Orion or something like that. Okay? Um, and you'll see they do this in conversation. Write down the actual words they use. I went to a hedge fund, and they asked me, could I help out with BDD? And we were still doing BDD at a unit level, a class level then. And they had this little method. They said, we're, we're tr really struggling with the behavior of this method. Um, it says it should return true if it's France, Germany, or Italy, and it returns true if it's France, Germany, or Italy, or Spain. And they had got, should, should tell us if it's France, Germany, Italy, or Spain, as the method name in their tests. And I said, okay, so what is it actually telling you? Why is this method here? And they said, well, it's because it tells us whether something falls under EU regulation 12369. And I can touch type, so I was looking at them and just typing should tell us if it falls under EU regulation Blah, 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 but obviously in Java, so without the spaces. And they looked at me and just went, is that all you do? You talk to people and write down what they say? I went, yeah, that's BDD, okay? <laughs> Ask for an example, write it down. Worry about the gherkin later. When you capture people's ideas, just do it in the lightest way possible. You're minimizing that level of investment. Once you have an understanding even if you've only got kind of a small team and you don't have time to do multiple parallel, you've probably got one idea, but it will take time to develop the understanding of what it is you're really doing and to make those discoveries, and then you start stabilizing it. This is where most agile practices fit really well. You know what the product should look like now. You know who the core audience is going to be, and you can start iterating around it. And then you get an understanding of the problem and it stabilizes. So here's the new rules. We're going to start by exploring by example. Not specifying by example, just trying things out. Having a conversation with people. At this stage, if you 
aren't throwing away some of the examples you're talking about, you're probably not exploring enough. The ones you keep become your specifications, and you write them down. And again, you don't necessarily need to use Gherkin for that, especially not if it's really boring and it's not going to change. It's enough just to write the rules. In fact, if it's not going to change, it's enough to test it manually. The only reason you have automated tests is so you can change things. And then you test by example. OK, it's a little bit about testing. So exploring by example is the most important thing you can do. That's more important than specifying things by example. And specifying things by example is more important than testing things by example. And that is why having the conversation is more important than capturing the conversation, which is more important than automating the conversation. That's all I wanted to tell you today. That's it. Thank you very much.